we are now recording. So thank you for attending uh, the first academic session of the morning. Um, we have Carmen and Tim from Nipissing University talking to us this morning. Uh, just a reminder, you can apply for the conference badge if you attend five or more sessions across this three-day conference. Please ensure your full name is showing on your Zoom account so that we can record that information for attendance purposes and, of course, for the badge. Um, just some housekeeping. Please stay muted for the session. You can type your question in the chat, or if you'd like to use your mic, you can raise uh, use the raise hand button and then wait to be addressed. Um, Tim and Carmen have requested that we address the questions at the end of the session, so I will be monitoring the chat and Carmen and Tim will kind of alternate that as well, but we will address those questions at the very end if we're not able to um, accommodate them right at the beginning. Um, okay, so Tim and Carmen, take it away. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tim Sibold. I'm um, an associate professor at uh, Nipissing University, focused on math education, of course. I'm also the editor of the uh, OEME Gazette. Uh, if any of you ever fancy writing an article, I'm easy to talk to on that front as well. Carmen? Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmen Worsted. Um, uh, I I'm an instructor, but lately I've been working um, um, with the Indigenous Education Institute here in Thunder Bay uh, called the Oshki Wenjak uh, Education Institute. Uh, and I start wearing a lot of hats. So uh, I was hired as a research analyst and then I um, um, transition into uh, accessibility and now I'm a special project coordinator <laughs> and um, yeah it's um, it's been a, a journey so uh, yes that's my background. So our focus today is to talk about communication uh, particularly with respect to college students and uh, Carmen's going to uh, speak to some research that she's been involved with uh, after we set up some context for it. Um, change the slide, there we go. So our focus is specifically on communication and um, I, I'm gonna set it up, but in a, a reasonably abstract fashion as academics tend to do. Um, but I want to speak to the pandemic itself and where that might get placed in an abstract sense, which then gets sort of worked into the, the uh, pragmatic details. And as the talk goes on, you'll find it gets more and more concrete. Uh, and hopefully that sheds some light on um, what we've all been living through. So you've likely heard the adage, uh, the medium is the message. Uh, Marshall McLuhan is the one who said this early on, and he was describing uh, the place of media changes, uh, the role of radio, television, and in fact, this photo of him having a glass of port and smoking a cigar at the University of Toronto while holding court with his students it was very much a, a sort of how to reconcile changes that were taking place in terms of media uh, in that day. And of course, what we've seen with um, the pandemic is the change of the medium to uh, video conferencing approaches, virtual classrooms, uh, much more distant communication. Uh, some, of, some of us have spoken to students on phones, uh, for instance, not all of us. Very few have met students face-to-face -face during the pandemic, but some have. And this actually fits with uh, something that Bill Gates was talking about at the end of the 1990s, where the internet uh, was starting to take hold. Personal computers were quite common, but not every household. 
the early days of the cell phone, the big chunky ones with an antenna um, were available. Digital cameras were starting to come out, digital frames, this sort of thing. And Bill Gates spoke about the convergence of technology. That it was evident to him at that point that the computer and the cell phone and the radio would all start to overlap somewhat. And he talked about uh, certain science, uh, science fiction ideas such as walls that would change the wallpaper daily and uh, having pictures on the wall that would change the picture from one famous uh, picture to the next on a daily basis. And many of these ideas have informed video conferencing where we now have the ability to have a slide, to have faces, to have gestures, and uh, um, much more uh, facility for a, a theatrical piece, you know, showing materials and this sort of thing. And that is very much the convergence towards a virtual classroom. But it's not the same, and this is why we wanted to emphasize uh, the communication aspect, because communication itself has changed and uh, the medium has obliged that. So it is the pinnacle of, of technology today. Um, I think there's a debate starting about how we will move past the pandemic. Will virtual teaching take on a, a sense of permanence, perhaps in conjunction with hybrid teaching? Uh, it has been noted that this is actually the fifth or sixth pandemic since the year 2000. So in many respects, it is a matter of time until the next one comes along. And the issue uh, is really the extent that it affects the population. So as we struggle with the uh, online teaching, we're also preparing for the next time. And that is why we really feel that understanding the relationship between this medium and the message is so important. And that's where Carmen's research uh, aligns. Go ahead, Carmen. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, um... <clears throat> At the end of February, uh, I'm not speaking only for myself, but I think I speak for many of us. Uh, our world became very, very small. Uh, we were confined to our households and uh, trying to do the best we can to deliver our uh, courses. Uh, at that time, I was teaching uh, at the Confederation College um, and um, my classes were um, made uh, out of, you know, 85% um, international students, or even more. So um, the my part of the talk is going to um, take in consideration two things. One is going to be about my own experience. Uh, as you hear, I have an accent. So I have the experience of teaching international students and being a student uh, here uh, in Canada that um, uh, English was her second language is not I'm uh, English is not my mother tongue. So um, I'll talk about communication with international students and also um, uh, in the past year, I have been you know, lucky to actually do some research on um, the impact of COVID-19 uh, on um, uh, students learning, uh, more predominantly to Indigenous students learning. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about that when uh, I'll come to it. So the first slide that you are going to see here is a quote uh, from one of the students that I have interviewed in telling about how she feels disconnected um, uh, because there is no interaction. Um, there is no interaction between her and classmates. Um, so, uh, and also, um, 
they are all online. They don't see each other. Um, the technical difficulty sometimes uh, um, imposes to actually shut down the camera so nobody sees each other. And uh, because of this, she feels that she's disconnected um, and there is no sense of community for her. So um, moving forward, uh, do I have powers? Uh, Tim? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I don't have any powers. Okay. Um, so um, uh, as Tim said, we are going to uh, look at communication. Um, and um, we are looking, uh, we are going to look at communication as defined as a process by which information is exchanged between individuals through a common system of symbols, signs, uh, or behavior. Uh, this implies that all parties have a good mutual understanding of the language, the signs, and the symbols. We are very familiar in mathematics that, uh, you know, uh, if you don't understand the, the signs and the symbols that we are going to use, you're going to have a difficult time uh, getting the concept. Uh, but also semiotic conventions um, as um, um, are associated with um, having like making meaning, right? Uh, so they are associated with signs and also behaviors that uh, facilitate meaning. Um, yeah. So um, when um, we communicate, um, we also try to make ourselves understood um, and um, this presentation, as I said, is going to focus on the international students and uh, some of the challenges they, they, uh, they have when they are coming into our classrooms and uh, just making you aware, like what should you be aware about um, when you have international students in the class. So can we move forward? Yeah. So again, uh, we consider two cases. So I'm going to talk about two cases, as I said before, about communication barriers and strategies used to minimize this uh, and um, how we can minimize these barriers when working with international students or students uh, whose, um, uh, um, where English is uh, their second language and also students that, um, are in a virtual environment. So, so for international stu uh, students, again, I said that I'm going to focus on one instructor should be aware uh, when teaching you know, students that are coming from a different culture uh, and also they are speaking a different language uh, as a mother tongue. So some of uh, the challenges um, that we encounter as instructors, students are coming with different epistemologies or ways of knowing uh, when they are coming in our classroom. And um, um, this um, type of way of know uh, knowing may present challenges when we would like to have a constructivist approach to our you know, instruction. Um, this means that instead of having, you know, an instructor centered type of classroom, we would like to have a more uh, learner uh, centered uh, type of instruction where the students have to participate to be able to actually conduct our, our lessons. So, um, some of these um, epistemologies might be, you know, like students may come from a power distant culture. So what power distant culture means, means that um, they are coming from uh, an authoritative type of culture uh, or the learning that they do um, or, or they're imparted with, they have this idea that the instructor is, uh, you know, the authoritative figure and, um, they have a hard time uh, interacting with the instructor or um, speaking out loud about um, you know, their ideas um, or 
if there is some challenges or challenging ideas, they will refrain from, from saying anything. Um, this goes to silence as a communication. So some people um, and some mid Middle Eastern countries uh, and cultures, um, they are uh, actually um, not wanting, they don't, don't, don't feel um, comfortable in um, um, talking out loud about uh, their knowledge. And um, this um, is going to make a difference in the way we are going to, you know, get the information from them, what kind of assessments we want to do and how we communicate to them if they, you know, they choose to not engage uh, in, in expressing their knowledge or opinion out loud and freely. And uh, some of us might be informal in the approach of classes, uh, of, of, uh, to our classes. And sometimes this informal approach may lead some international students to believe that the learning environment is devoid of formality. And, um, um, it can lead sometimes to type of my more forward behavior from some students or um, classroom mismanagement. So this is about the different epistemologies, but um, language barriers, I can tell you. Uh, so one concept is Fosami. Um, I, I'm going to define this concept as um, uh, the word uh, sounds very familiar. It's spelled very, uh, very uh, the same in English and in a different language, but the meaning it's different. So, um, uh, an example from my, you know, from my from when I was a student, uh, I was uh, taking um, uh, physics at the uh, uh, Laurentian University. So one of the concepts that I'm going to tell you is about the linear momentum. So in Romanian, uh, momentum is moment. So it's very close there. They, it's, you know, you just add the U-M at the end and you have the English spelling. However, the, the, their meaning is completely different. So the momentum, it's, you know, associated with the linear momentum, which is Def define as a uh, product of mass times velocity. However, moment in Romanian is more associated with torque and rotation. So again, there is that disconnect for people or students who are coming, you know, in your classes, they're international students, and sometimes they will have, you know, a different um, meaning for the concept that you are going to teach. So it's good for for you to, you to be well, for you to be aware of that. So this means that you know sometimes they might not comprehend a, a terminology. Uh, this is not uh, you know purview to all international students. I can tell you that even my Canadian students have a hard time to distinguish between uh, let's say uh, uh, precision and. Uh, um, um, Oh, what else? Yeah, so it's not for you only to, to international student. And uh, also another thing that we can um, consider is uh, plagiarism uh, and expectations of intellectual property. So for people who uh, <clears throat> are having international students to do uh, some um, assignments, uh, they might see that <clears throat> Um, they have a difficulty in actually understanding what um, plagiarism means. Um, and the reason for it is maybe in their culture, you know, uh, copying somebody else's, it's uh, seen as, uh, uh, you know, uh, tribute to that person. However, here in Western society, we need to uh, make sure that um, the concept of authorship and the uh, author as an owner of text is imposed and uh, uh, students know exactly about 
uh, what plagiarism means. Um, so from that point of view, um, again, you have to be realizing that being a non-English speaker, sometimes imitation is a way of learning. Um, and um, um, by imitating, usually you are learning a way of communicating. Uh, and that's not going to last for a long time until you are getting your own uh, style and your, or your own way of um, uh, conveying meaning through through writing uh, is going to be you know a little bit hard to to pass that threshold. So uh, let's go through the next slide. So what are some of the recommendations that we can adopt to lift some of this barrier that international students face? So. Um, um, as students come from a, you know, a more authoritative type of uh, society and culture, uh, and they put you know, a lot of emphasis on the authority of the instructor, um, they sometimes don't develop a critical, uh, critical thinking that the way that we would like to see in our classrooms and problem solving. So, uh, now, just be more explicit in, and give a lot of example and model critical thinking, what critical thinking is, is and uh, you understand by, so they can actually um, get used to it. Also, um, um, when you give it uh, like um, uh, assignments uh, and expectations for assignments, uh, just be a little bit more clear and more descriptive uh, about what the expectations are and just give them clear rubrics that they can actually tick and say, okay, I've done this, I've done this. So that is going to be uh, something to consider. Uh, also, um, we should make a great effort um, to explain um, some of the expectations beyond the syllabus. Um, some um, kind, some students might need to just be uh, shown what is an example of a good assignment? What is an example of a good, uh, you know, um, answer? What is an example of a, you know, a good problem solving uh, or demonstration or proof? Um, and, um, also, they need to understand the value of intellectual property and accurate documentation. And again, this uh, can be done through, you know, providing a little bit more examples and working with some students to actually understand that uh, copying somebody, uh, it's, it's an infraction, it's not your original thought. So uh, yeah, can we go a little bit further? So that being said, um, I'm going to focus now on what challenges um, are with communication in an online environment. Uh, this uh, is mostly um, so um, based on the results of uh, uh, my, my research that I did in the last year. And uh, again, I'm going to focus on the challenges with the online learning that uh, um, I got from the research and also some of the recommendations, strategies and best practices um, for sustaining and improving you know, the communication for online education. Um, so um, a student that is successful in uh, in the online environment, it's it you know it has to be um, a highly visual, independent thinker, highly motivated, uh, highly organized, and have a good time management tools. Now, uh, this uh, picture that you see in here, um, it's um, uh, some of the results uh, that uh, I got from what causes 
anxiety and lower academic achievement uh, in the online learning. And as you see in here, the three most, you know, uh, um, chosen um, features were that uh, unable to communicate with teachers and education staff. So communication was uh, very important. The next one is well, they were unable to perform well on tests and exams. And the third one that goes with the good time management um, uh, tools and organization falling behind on their schoolwork. Um, okay, can we go further? So um, some of the, my results, um, like the themes that they, they came from and analyzing the results of the uh, research um, were threefold. Some of them, there were technological issues that the students had, uh, but also uh, uh, was quality instruction that refer to materials, activities, readings, clarity, uh, in expe uh, um, instructors' expectations, ease of course navigations, learning outcomes and assessments and instructors' presence online. And uh, the third one was communication as referring to interaction between learners and instructors and between learners and support staff and among learners. Um, so uh, can we go further? So from the student's perspective, what the student's concerns had, like some of the, the uh, issues and you know, um, sub-themes that I found was a lack of adaptation of teaching style for online environment. So some of the students said that uh, the instructors um, were not adapting fast enough or well enough to teaching online. Uh, and, you know, uh, to be sincere here, uh, we had to actually go from an in-class environment to online environment practically overnight. So it was a steep curve for every one of us. Uh, another one, it was lack of instructors present and, av and availability um, and timely and appropriate feedback when they are online uh, on online environment and also uh, unclear expectation about what is required in assignments, um, availability of resources and complex course navigation. So these were the the things that you know students you know communicated uh, while they were interviewed. So they they came with this you know uh, concerns, but also they said, well, you know maybe um, the instructors can offer an alternative way to contact. Uh, us, you know, such as phone calls. Mind you, phone calls are a little bit, uh, you know, you don't want to give your uh, phone call, uh, phone number <laughs> to your students that they will call you day and night, uh, but maybe just find another way of communicating besides emails. For them, emails were not something that was efficient. Um, also, uh, they said that, you know, a uh, faster response to the student email is going to be helpful for them, especially if they have um, questions about uh, assignments. Um, and uh, also, um, clear instructions and requirements uh, for students assessment, what the expectations are. They want it a little bit more spelled out for them. Uh, also, um, they said that maybe, you know, because we are online, maybe a bit of first contact with students during an orientation, online orientation will, you know, will be more beneficial. Um, and um, presentation uh, to identify where the, they find, the, uh, they can uh, find the resources 
um, and also a presentation about how to navigate the learning man management system that they are going to use is going to be beneficial for them. Okay, the next one. Now, in interviewing instructors and student success uh, um, staff, um, they had the same kind of problem. So communication was not a problem only for students, but was a problem also for instructors and the uh, student support staff. So one of the instructors said, well, when I'm sending an email that has more than one issue, I usually get an email back with the students answering only the first point in the email. I am left to wonder if the students really read my emails. So um, from the instructor's point of view, uh, communicating through emails uh, was very inefficient. Um, and uh, one of the, the instructors said, well, I feel like I have to read between the line, um, uh, the lines, like um, language, but like from the students in the emails were not clear. Uh, the students were not fully re uh, reading the emails. They were skimming over. Well, I do the same thing sometimes. Um, and the, also students needed help in understanding the assignments and expectations and the requirements from instructors and that wasn't um, conveyed very well through through emails or announcements on you know learning management systems so as we said you know email it's a inefficient way of communicating uh, uh, some of the student success staff said that you know emails you know, they can be disregarded, they can be ignored. We always had to actually uh, make phone calls to reach the students that they were in trouble. Um, again, uh, unclear use of knowledge. And uh, because of that, uh, we had um, um, like where, like what I saw in the last year or so is that the students were are totally disengaged. Um, I'm not sure how uh, your attendance is in your classrooms right now. Uh, however, um, where I'm working for the attendance, uh, it's uh, it's minimal. There there are ways so to make students accountable, uh, but that's another that's another story. So let's go a little bit further. So what are some of the proposed recommendations for faculty instructors to better communicate in an online environment? So um, one of it is like what that came uh, from both students and, and, and instructors and support staff uh, was that maybe we should establish a more personalized, humanized presence such as uh, such that students feel connected and willing to reach out if they have a problem. So you can personalize your, you know, your um, introduction um, uh, to your uh, course. Uh, you can just tell a little bit about more about yourself uh, just try to make a personal connection to the students that they are on the other side of the screen. Um, also, um, uh, one thing that most uh, students ask for is that provide clear guidelines uh, for interaction between uh, uh, instructors and students. So, um yeah emails are good but also tell them okay i'm going to answer your email within so many hours uh if uh, email doesn't work and there is an emergency maybe you can contact this number or whatever um so you need you need some guidelines uh and the, they have to be spelled out to to the students um, also, some of the students said, well, you know, with the with um, online instruction, 
um, faculty needed to provide clear and constructive feedback. Um, and um, uh, they felt that they didn't have that. Um, and um, Oh, I think the next one, it's um, uh, the providing course information, also uh, how to navigate the specific learning management system, uh, just make a presentation where they can find the relevant information, what is important and what is not. Yeah. Okay, Tim. Sorry about that, Carmen. That's I think okay. I jumped ahead a That's bit too fine. quick. There is one question in the chat. Uh, Vanessa has asked whether your research was done after the initial conversion to online learning or after one semester of online learning. Uh, was, was done, um, you know how we had that um, uh, semester where half of it was face-to-face -face and the other half of it was online. So it was just after that online transition it was done then yeah so we wanted to uh, follow this up um, in part this actually originated from uh, a uh, a small project I was doing where uh, I was needing parts for uh, uh, a box I was making and I think we can all sort of relate to this uh, challenge of globalization where communication becomes a challenge. And this, uh, this product that uh, I was uh, buying is known as a stay, right? and it's for holding a cupboard door open. And the idea is that you can lift your, um, your cupboard door and it will stay up. And many of us have seen these sorts of things. So, and when I got the product, it came with uh, an outline. This uh, speaks to all sorts of things about how to adjust it, but it lacks a whole lot of details. And I didn't feel, I'm sort of like the student. I didn't feel I could communicate with the manufacturer to say, what is the deal with this? It took nearly an hour to figure out how to make a, the left hand, right hand uh, switch over. And so we are seeing the same communication difficulty in the global marketplace and experiencing it on a daily basis, except that you are more aligned with the student role than you are with the instructor role when that happens. Here's the actual box. And um, the challenge with this is that that lid is quite large. Now a stay is supposed to hold the lid open. So you're, you're supposed to be able to take the box like this, lift the lid a little, and the lid will stay like that. Or you can open it like so, and it will stay like that. This lid is far too big. And the piece that's missing in all of this uh, information is anything to talk about the moment. Uh, and I, I don't mean that in the Romanian sense, I mean that in the English sense. The, the torque, that lid is forcing against the stay and this simply does not work. And the, the marketing for the product made no mention whatsoever of the torque that this device could handle. And if you go to a North American manufacturer, they have the torque specifications. But initially, you don't know what you don't know, and the communication doesn't tell you that this is something you should be considering. And so that communication is, is a, a crucial detail. And it's, it's evident in the global marketplace, which is ahead of globalization of our, our teaching. And so the pandemic has really brought out this challenge of the communication. And international students particularly are challenged with this. And, and we have, more local examples, 
if you have French immersion students, students who've been in French immersion, uh, in French, uh, reciprocal functions and inverse functions are labeled the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, an inverse function en français is a reciprocal function, as far as I understand it. And a reciprocal function en français is an inverse function in English. <laughs> and, and that's an example that comes directly out of the high school curriculum. And you can find it among uh, students who've been in French immersion. So as the, the technology continues, uh, and in whatever way it does, this communication becomes increasingly challenging. And as an instructor, we also want um, to have a balance of work and life. We don't want to be available 24-7. Uh, the need for um, prompt communication that benefits students contravenes our needing to get other stuff done. And so that, that balance, it sort of begs questions of, can we do things a little bit differently uh, in order to facilitate that? Can we use our flex hours to a benefit, for instance? There's a question in the chat. Uh, there was an American Federal Secretary of Education who said in education, nothing works if the students won't. Any student in my course who engaged with the course do extremely well. The problem is to get them all to engage. Uh, when repeated emails do not improve engagement with the course activities, are there other tools which can help? Um, an answer that comes to mind on this uh, is the um, heavily researched uh, approach known as cooperative learning. And that is gets mistaken as using groups, and it's not using groups. Uh, it involves groups, but the groups have uh, a mandate where they... Um, Oh, what's the word? The, there's a, a, a requirement that they interact with each other for the benefit of both parties. So there's always a, an added layer to avoid freeloaders that um, positive interdependence is, is the proper term for it. And it, it creates a circumstance where um, the students apply peer pressure to get the other ones engaged. And it's, it's one technique. It's a little different to do online. You need breakout rooms, this sort of thing to get smaller groups. Uh, another example that I've run into, uh, and I use Blackboard with my students, I have a virtual classroom. It doesn't close. And that's beneficial. I, I point out to my students that if they want to meet each other, they can go to that virtual classroom outside of classroom hours. And, and they can use it to talk to each other. And I, I found that some students actually appreciate that because they're not having to give out uh, private information like their phone number, for instance. It, it gives them a, a video conferencing option where they have the protection of somewhat being anonymous uh, relative to other students. And so sometimes it's a case of giving these opportunities uh, for students to engage with each other and that improves motivation. Carmen, I, I shouldn't blather on. Would you like to speak yeah, to this no, as that's well? A, um, <clears throat> That's the couple of uh, good points. Uh, some of the recommendations <laughs> that uh, I found uh, uh, that um, people suggested uh, in my research was making students more accountable. Um, well, one of it was making sure that um, 
their cameras are on and uh, making sure that uh, when they are participating, they, they are fully engaged. Uh, that might work uh, or not work, depending on, you know, um, how good your internet <laughs> connection is. Uh, we just, uh, you know, I just had problems connecting this morning. So um, some of the time uh, you might say, you know what, um, just um, disconnect your camera and, uh, you know, like maybe you are going to be able to at least audit the, 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 the lecture. So the technology, sometimes uh, the internet connection sometimes is not feasible for that. Uh, the other ones was um, uh, type of gamification, just, uh, you know, getting some badges or getting something that's extrinsically, you know, motivating for students, whatever that is. Um, so, uh, for example, um, because uh, this study was done on Indigenous uh, uh, students, uh, for them, uh, for and especially up north, um, you know, some of the incentives where hey, we are going to give you a grocery, you know, um, uh, flat, uh, like um, voucher where you can go and get your groceries or something like that. But uh, I am not saying that you should do that, but maybe just find an extrinsic uh, motivation way to, to get your students involved. It's definitely an area that we wrestle with. Um, the students I teach are um, going to become professional teachers. And early in the pandemic, my attitude was professionalism requires you show up, but teachers got to be in the classroom. But uh, what I rapidly found was that the engagement was higher in classes where the participation actually contributed to marks yeah uh, and so i wrestle with that i don't like it but it is part of the medium and there is a sense that you can simply engage in something uh by observing it if it's online without actually um, actively participating and so there there are questions that we need to wrestle with uh, as instructors of, is there a way that we can actually attribute marks, at least in part, to the engagement piece? And I, I don't like it. And um, I saw a mention here of third year business students, and I should hope that they don't require that. But, uh, you know, if, if that's what it takes, then maybe we need to dabble with are we talking about 5% of the mark? Are we talking 10% of the mark? You know, and, and, and saying what is the enough to sort of get them over the hump. Um, I also ran into cases where we weren't getting the whole story. As soon as the pandemic required that, that my courses went online, I had students who assumed that that meant asynchronous and they went out and got jobs. And those jobs then conflicted with the class time because I maintained things as uh, uh, synchronous initially. And um, we sorted that out. And so there, there will inevitably be some students who don't engage, but really what I think is uh, we need to keep the eye on here is you want to, improve the engagement and not sweat the fact that maybe you can just never get absolutely everybody engaged. It, it is a strange medium. And so perhaps uh, this is one of those things where asking your students um, what actually encourages them to engage would pay off. My students, uh, I asked them about all their classes and I said, what's working in your other classes and what isn't. And um, they pointed out that participation marks were being used in virtually every other class that they had. And um, 
I, I don't have to like it. Nobody ever said you have to like the answer, but uh, it sure has made a difference. And uh, I have not done it in a huge way, but I have done it somewhat. I think there is a challenge as far as, uh, you know, we look at things and we think we're offering a lot to our students with videos and uh, uh, online classes. And, you know, that's legitimate. At the same time, the students are missing the cues that they normally get in the classroom. If you walk around a classroom and uh, you chit chat with your students, uh, there isn't really a parallel to that in the online environment. And uh, you don't get a sense of which students are struggling which ways. The, the students who maybe have language difficulties can be hidden in an online environment unless you get them to uh, participate. And they may be reluctant to do that because it gets seen by everybody. So the challenge for us as educators is what things can we do to mitigate that? And you can almost do with having breakout groups where you go around to the different breakout groups and if those groups are relatively small, and this takes time, it, it, it's very slow and it's uh, mildly awkward, but in a group of four or five people, they will virtually all volunteer to say something on a microphone and, and you get more of a personal interaction that way. Um, oh, uh, there was a message from Vanessa, I think, uh, where it said, the, were the recommendation acting on and how did it inform teaching the next semester? I can tell you uh, that some of the recommendations are acting on right now. Uh, we are uh, trying to get instructors to um, communicate better and uh, um, with, um, uh, with the students, um, what we where we started, we started with um, the course shelves and uh, trying to get um, uh, the instructors to uh, to put their information uh, number or the information their contact information, how they can contact it and uh, what their guide guidelines are for that. Also. Um, we did a little bit about um, um, assessments and uh, how they are marked and what kind of rubrics they can use. So we started uh, doing a little bit of professional development with our instructors um, about um, using the learning management system um, well. Uh, and uh, also, and, uh, and doing a little bit of instructional design, uh, professional development with them as well. And uh, also because uh, most of the instructors are, uh, most of the students are indigenous students. Uh, we uh, are uh, presently doing a little bit uh, about uh, ind indigenous perspective and ways of uh, knowing and learning uh, professional development that I hope that they are going to um, help them um, serve their students a little bit better. One place that uh, I've had uh, considerable success this term was a uh, task where students had to post a one to two minute video um, of themselves just instructing something. Now, this is based on my focus where they're uh, learning how to teach. But um, if you can adapt this kind of make a one, one to two minute video and um, my students posted it and what this allowed them to do was it allowed them to see their classmates. It allowed to see them actively doing something. And um, when when I set this up, I 
made a point of saying offer constructive feedback and and positivity and and i emphasized those things and so there was a lot of uh, commenting back and forth about the good aspects of these videos and uh, what was useful in them and they it, what it requires is an open task where you can go in many different directions so that students can bring different things to the table. But it, uh, it really gave more sense of community rather than having the medium hold up the, the instruction. And that sense of community becomes a rallying point around the instructor, which is beneficial. Uh, I can see Monica eyeing us up, ready to uh, pull us off the stage because I know full well that the next round of presentations starts in four minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we have we you've been great with monitoring the chat, and it seems as though you've addressed all of the questions there. There are some comments uh, from I guess other members who have been giving out what they've been doing during the pandemic. So that's great. Um, yeah, so I guess if you wanted to make some last comments or if there were any last questions that uh, uh, members wanted to have, there we go. I, I think the one thing we don't have, uh, Carmen, is we don't have our email addresses up there, but uh, we can certainly be found easily enough. Um, yeah. Uh, so so yeah. Julian's hand is up. Maybe he has a final comment to make. Yeah, I did uh, kind of put it in the chat, but it does seem that, you know, as far as teaching goes, technology is actually imparting barriers um, rather than acting as an enabling force, which for many of us in our professional lives, technology is an enabling force. And that I guess for now, until there's some major quantum leaps in technology, we should maybe think about recommending mathematics instruction be done in the classroom. That's just a thought. <laughs> well, I think you, you end up making that case uh, on a, a sort of individual basis, and uh, definitely it is something uh, worth considering. There are quantum leaps in the works, and uh, some of the three-dimensional uh, virtual geometry work uh, and the use of virtual reality. At one stage, we had a three-dimensional version of our campus and you had an avatar and you could walk around the campus. And I think some of this um, proximity conversation tools that are out there where you can have all your students in a classroom and, and it has more of that feel of being in a gymnasium and talking to people who are close to you. And, and these are coming. And, um, but as to you know going forward, how you balance the benefits of the asynchronous hybrid with face-to-face, uh, -face. there are huge barriers to face-to-face. -face. Uh, it's very hard to find a college uh, in some parts of Canada, you know, for instance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last thought, uh, Carmen, and then I think yeah, we better Yeah, because we got one minute. Off. No, so no gonna start that's soon. fine. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank well, you so much for attending. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Tim and Carmen, for that very insightful talk. All right. Take care, everyone.